came into this awareness and then how you've continued to advocate on behalf of it. I'd love to do that. I am a special education teacher and I work uh, within a Christian school in Zeeland, Michigan, primarily uh, for an organization called All Belong Center for Inclusive Education. And uh, it was God lining up parent teacher conferences one year, three in a row. I will never forget this. It was in the late 1990s. And I just heard from these parents the struggles that they were having to find a place where they were welcome in worship and to find a Sunday school where all four of their children uh, could participate instead of three of their four. And uh, I was really shocked by that, primarily because all of the children we were talking about were already part of uh, Zealand Christian School and were successfully included in third grade or eighth grade or preschool for you know, seven hours a day. And uh, so uh, with parent permission, I uh, started to call some pastors and just said, you know, what's going on here? And every single time I heard their desire to include that child, uh, they wanted to do it. They knew why biblically they should do it. It was very clear. But what they lacked was the ability to know how. And I thought, okay, that's not a very big gap between what happens in a Christian school and what happens, um, especially for children in a church. It's a social setting. There's learning going on. There's worship going on. And I thought, could we take some tools from this environment and translate them to the church set? And that grew from thinking about children and youth, to thinking about adults. Uh, tomorrow I'm going to speak here in Holland, Michigan, on uh, better including and connecting with persons with dementia. So again, that, that that's a long range when we think of people of varied abilities. But it has been my joy since the late 1990s through books or through speaking or through one-on-one -on -one contacts with congregations uh, to be the church services director for All Belong uh, Center for Inclusive Education. So that has been uh, just how it's happened and story by story, uh, just watching congregations, watching uh, families find places of worship, watching individuals being free to use their gifts in a congregational setting. So really exciting and uh, God has opened doors I never had anticipated. Now that's, um, that's the story. Well, <laughs> what I thought was so fascinating when we started talking about inclusion or including children from special needs into Immediately, most of us think of the most extreme, you know, right. the kid in the wheelchair that isn't able to communicate, that has to use multiple devices and support services and things like that. And then you could see a church saying, oh, I don't know if we have the nursing staff. I don't know if we have the trained faculty to handle that. But when you started talking to me about the idea that there are senior citizens that could be qualified as needing special services or disabled or adults that are fully functioning, integrated into their school systems or into their workplace, but because of the environment they're entering, hasn't been prepared or hasn't been, they ha they're, haven't been involved, then all of a sudden it's a barrier. And so let's talk about the range of clients that um, you've been able to assist just to sort of myth bust that idea that you're trying to get the extreme included, but you're trying to get everyone included. And inclu and then you had also mentioned a statistic about the, the population or the percentage of the population that this would encompass. Right, so there's two ways to think about it. And one is a more strict word called disability here in the United States. And that figure varies from country to country, but in the United States, uh, if they would say, how many people have some kind of a disability? Uh, believe it or not, that's about 20%. And as you look at the adults, they just released a figure that it's about 25% that qualify for that designation. And so I'll often say, if you think about a church, uh, it could be an infant with spina bifida, it could be a toddler with Down syndrome, an elementary age child with ADHD or a learning disability. It could be a, a youth group member with autism spectrum disorder, an adult with bipolar disorder, or it could be a senior uh, who may have limited vision, mobility, memory, uh, hearing, that list uh, you know, goes on and on. So again, we're talking about a lot of people that just even think fall in that 20 to 25%, but to even broaden that more, if you think of that term 
varied abilities or all abilities, uh, which I sort of love to use because the truth is that even uh, dumps way many more of us in that category. So let's imagine a congregation where you have some individuals who may not qualify for that 20 to 25 percent, but they might be English language learners and your service happens in English. Uh, you may have an individual, you know, to me, the best definition of varied abilities is an intergenerational worship service where you have a three-year-old standing next to a 57-year-old. You know, <laughs> talk about difference in understanding and language and energy, right? All of those things are true. And so if you can make some concrete changes that are part of worship, that are part of uh, your small groups, whether those are for children or adults or seniors, uh, you right away have opened the door uh, for so many. I often ask when I speak, who here likes it that I've brought along some visuals, some things to look at, as I almost always do, uh, and uh, how many people appreciate that because you learn best if you can see something. About 95% of people will raise their hand for that. And I think, well, okay, I may have thought I need to put some visuals or concrete items embedded in our worship service, uh, for example. Uh, but how many people will that actually benefit? Well, now we're talking about 95% that would say, I will remember this worship service better if I can see something. I mean, that that is exciting to me that um, we can build in some changes that can impact that many people in a positive way. Let's sort of go through the list of easy to fix, takes a little bit more effort and really needs to be part of a plan to fix. Sure. And I think you set up what I love to talk with any community. So I've spent some time at a summer camp this summer. You're exactly right. These principles can be applied many places. They were birthed out of a Christian school setting. Uh, I've uh, spoken at lots of different community settings. So you are right, the people who are listening in. If you're coaches, I hope these three parts make sense to you. Um, but I think these three parts really help define that easy to hard. And I think, though, to begin, you have to have a common perspective. Uh, you have to share a common perspective with the community in order to understand. So forgive me, I, I am a teacher. I brought along a couple of things. But <laughs> you guys, she has visual aids for us. You know that she's been in education for what, 25 years? Well, maybe I'm a little older than that. So maybe this is year 36. So there the kids keep you young. Yeah, that's right. Um, so I'm holding a half green, half pink puzzle piece in front of me. Uh, and I often say, if we can cast this puzzle piece perspective, we are so much further along. And I think um, it goes back to a biblical concept, not only of individuals, but community. And so as we think of people and that scripture in Psalm 139, where it says, God knit us together, uh, I think he did so with green and pink yarn. Green for those things that are easy for us to do. And pink would be for our hot spots, our challenges, the things that are difficult. And the truth is, every one of us can write our name right here on this puzzle piece and say, yep, that's me. I have things that are gifts. I have things that are challenges. Um, but that makes up who I am. And I think what tends to happen when we look at a person with a disability is sometimes that person becomes an all pink person. And you may say, oh, it's Down syndrome, Jonathan. It's cerebral palsy, Sue. It's wheelchair, Bob. It's uh, dementia, Frank. And it's like that defines the whole piece. That's not scriptural either. There's many other scriptures that say that God has given each one gifts to bring to the body. Uh, every person has the, that green and pink puzzle piece. And so I think that uh, that may be um, Jonathan or your daughter or whoever that may be. Uh, Jonathan, who happens to be gifted in memory, in drama, in emotions, in uh, communi com you know, communicating to people, whatever that may be, uh, may struggle in certain areas, who may also happen to have cerebral palsy, Down syndrome, name, name it. But that is genuinely true for all of us. And I guess the other part, um, as we see that each person has gifts to bring to the community, um, that also allows us to see God's master design, I think, well illustrated in 1 Corinthians 12, 18, where it says, but in fact, God has arranged or placed the parts in the body, each one of them, just as he wanted them to be. So we look at those connections that we have with each other, places where I'm strong, I can come alongside of you, and places where you're strong, you can come alongside of me. So today is a great example of that, Eric. You have people that are built up in your life, you have skills to be able to do this kind of a format. And I bring a piece of information that we hope, our puzzle pieces are linked for this 
space of time, right? So we give to that. But I think how easy it has been, whether that is a summer camp, whether that is a congregation, whether even sometimes it's an extended family event. Uh, I think of Thanksgiving and Christmas coming up, but uh, let's go back to a, to a congregation. How easy it may say, be to say, sorry, we just don't have anything for you here. And you pull that one person away. Um, try the church down the road, uh, you know, try the summer camp down the road, try the whatever that may be. But the truth is, if it's true that God hand knit each piece and then designs us, arranges us in communities to grow us, to make us stronger in a way we had not yet experienced. I always ask the question, when that person is sent away, who loses? And I would say everybody, you know, that individual doesn't have access to whatever group that we're talking about, but so did the group because that individual God had intended to arrange to grow them in some way that we may not even be aware of. They just sent that person away. And I think that if we can grab onto that perspective as a community, the desire to say, you know what? We might not like the taste of gluten-free communion bread or uh, <laughs> Lord's Supper element, might not be our first pick, but if that allows all the people worshiping together to say, I remember what, what the Lord did for me. I remember what God did through me through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. If that allows 100% of us to come to the table today, then I'm all in because that keeps our puzzle together. And so I think some of the changes come from sharing that perspective. This, this isn't just, you know, a, a, a whimsy. It's not politically correct. This is blueprint in scripture to say, look, the eye doesn't say to the hand, I don't need you. We are designed to be together, um, one body together in Christ. And sometimes that means we need to plant some different things in place. So um, I think perspective is really important. Um, when we talked, I think I identified my second piece and we can talk further about this. I'll do this a little faster, but that whole <laughs> idea of universal design. So architects build buildings and they don't run around to people and say, oh, I see you're a wheelchair user. Um, are you going to be using this building because we'll put an elevator in it? They don't do that. They put the elevator in it from the beginning because they are expecting people of varied abilities to use that building. So they've got curb cutouts and they've got, you know, all of these other features that are just built in. Educators love it. We call it universal design for learning. We're not just going to say everybody has to write one report. No, because some people might rather be gifted in building a display or speaking their words, whatever that might be. So we build in choices and options. So, um, you know, like I said, Lord's Supper, do we have a gluten-free station available or do we just serve gluten-free bread? Do we say at the beginning of the service, everybody stand up? Because as soon as that worship leader says, everybody stand, you have now drawn a line between those that can do it and those that are not able to stand for chronic pain reasons, for who knows what, they have a sleeping child in their arms. What if we just simply change that to saying, please stand in body or in spirit. Now you've just made one simple change that invites everybody there into the opportunity to worship. So I think many times, I, I often say too, um, they need to get rid of those mini golf pencils in the pews in church and put a few of these around. Now these are, whoops, I got to get it in front of the fidget no, pencils, no. right? So what if we just had a few things like this available for people? Would that help more people enter into the message? Do we just put these in kid environments or do we finally say, hey, there's several adults who would love to be holding this pencil? One uh, community just simply put them in bags. They call them pew pouches. And they set some things on the end of the pew and they said, hey, feel free to use a fidget item. If it makes it easier to listen, please return to the baggies. Large print, hearing loops. Uh, there's a whole long list of things that we can do. And that translates summer camps. Okay, you know what? There are some children whose anxiety meter is so high about going to that group. What if we just put a preview online on your website that allows people to sort of experience it before you get there? All of those are things. You don't have to wait for one person to need it. You just do it. Um, what you mentioned about your daughter, I think is so great because that leads into part three. Sometimes uh, you need a little more information about a person in order to allow that person to be successfully included. So universal design covers so many different features. You just put things in place. But maybe we need to know a little bit about your daughter in order for her to have a safe and or more meaningful experience. So you just simply gave information. We call that the third part, a personalized plans or responsive design for 
fitting with our universal and you know uh, responsive design. But we really need to get to know an individual. So it might be a person with dementia. Maybe we need to understand a bit more about how that person can participate. Maybe we know, um, while we wouldn't typically do this with everybody, we know that in order to make meaning, this person's going to need to hold a little figure of a cross as we're talking about this experience. They need to touch something at this point in their life. Um, we need to provide a few more pictures, whatever that may be, but the plan becomes personalized. So that's the three-part plan. And I would contend, I put it in a, in a congregational setting because I'm pretty passionate about that. I think we need to be leaders in this and not followers. And uh, we need to say, look, um, this is a value to our God. We're not doing this because some law of the land. We're doing this because of how God wants us to build our communities. So those three parts. And again, changing gluten-free bread, getting a few large print copies of something might not be quite as significant as training your congregation that it's okay to have like pew pouches with some different kinds of fidgets. But um, I think that's uh, often a great place to begin. It is. When we started talking and I became more aware, I thought, okay, I'm just going to sit in church this week and be in Barbara's eyes instead of my normal go along. And I happened to be a communion Sunday and they put the communion up front. And I looked around, and I thought, there are people that are not going to make it to the front. I mean, there are old people, there are people with children, there are like, I could see a range and it's dark in here. So now we have people that may have light sensitive vision issues, ambulatory issues, children that they can't leave sitting in the chair long enough to go because of it. And we've told them to participate, you have to walk 20 feet, 30 feet to the front of the room and then do this loop back to the back. And it's, you know, it's a traffic jam. I'm just going to announce it. No harm meant, Pastor Kevin. And nowhere did it say, if you're unable to join us at the front, please let us know and an usher will meet you at your seat. And I thought that requires one person with a tray or multiple people. And yet because nobody sat there in Barbara's seat and looked around and saw it, I thought, I've just denied, I, as a member of the body of the church, denied somebody the opportunity to participate in something. And it would have taken one more volunteer. So the cost, I, I mean, I can't even calculate a cost. And then I started to, again, I've been walking through life in Barbara's eyes for a while. So thank you. Even though I have a child with a disability, when you're the parent, you're kind of managing them versus like, <laughs> we have a different perspective getting them through a crowd. But I also remembered that it was a cattle call getting out of the, the service. And again, these same individuals that would have loved to be able to have a special exit or roped off area. So because often when you have ambulatory issues, once you're in momentum, it, it if you stay in momentum, but even all adults with older Jared, when you stop and you have to reset that balance and get everything back in line and then start and then stop. It becomes so exhausting that it's almost like, honey, I, I want to go to church. It's just trying to get back to the car that's killing me. Absolutely. And, you know, Eric, you made such a good point. I just want to highlight this. It begins with a couple of people often noticing. So your eyes are critical for change because we often just are not aware of that. And how easy is it to just build in some options to designate uh, one doorway as a doorway that's gonna be more calm. Um, you know, uh, we, we, those who uh, prefer a more lively entrance or exit can go here. If you prefer a, a slower walk in a little quieter area, you know, we've designated this door. It, you don't even have to say, okay, for people who use walkers, they can figure that out. But now we, put options in place for people. Um, it, it's just powerful. And I love your analogy, right? It would take, it would have taken one person, if you prefer to be served in your seat today, for whatever reason, uh, could be anxiety, could be a first time visitor. There's no way they're getting up. They had enough bravery to just get inside those doors, right? They are not going to get up, you know? So if you prefer, just, you know, raise your hand or whatever, and somebody will serve you at your seat. Options. Um, exactly, exactly. But you have to notice it first. And I think that that's often the place we begin noticing. I 
when we talked the other day and you said a lot of children with anxieties and sometimes they're more related to the autism spectrum, but not include uh, totally having a video that's shot on the kid's eye level from the car to the classroom, so to speak, yes. that explains what they're going to see, what it's going to be like, where they're going to be moving, and then what will happen reduces that, that, you know, hey, parents, by the way, we understand often children are a little nervous about joining Sunday school for the first time. We've put together a video packet, go to our church website, sit down and watch it. I know working in this population and working, though you may watch it 50 times, mm -hmm. but when they show up, they now know exactly where they're going to walk, what the door is going to look like, who the greeters get, like they can see it all. And then they're like, okay, I'm good. But when you think of the amount of stimulant from getting to the car to the classroom with the crowds and the noise, and there's often background music and people handing out things and shaker and food and like, no wonder the parents are like, you don't understand by the time we get to the classroom, we're done. <laughs> like, we're ready to put him back in the car and go home. Um, We've used up all of our energy dollars in the first five minutes of- Hey, I, I, I only attest because I am that parent. <laughs> I showed up. Right. And, you know, I often say, okay, um, uh, I look up stuff all the time before I go there. Everybody does. Well, you know, we look up hotels, we look at the museum we're going to see. They present what does the room look like? What's close by? You know, and truly, when I walk into a new hotel, I have scoped it out. I know what the reception area looks like. I know what my room is going to look like, most likely. And uh, we do it all the time. Why don't we do that? At the, at the summer camp, I was there too. Just, you know, lots of kids go into summer camp, have that anxiety. Without giving away the surprise of everything, there's a lot of stuff you can learn before you ever go about the layout, about what chapel is like, about, you know, whatever that might be. Um, it, it's a tool that we all use. So I agree. The tools that we put in place, which is why they call it universal design instead of accessible design. Accessible design is talking about the 20 to 25%. Universal design says, you know what? That curb cut cutout might have been for a person who's a wheelchair user, but I see you, mama, with that stroller. You're going to use that curb cutout. Uh, you're going to use several other features that are built in because it benefits universally the people that use that space. Mm -hmm. I love it. And what here's where the awareness, here's where it really sort of switched for me is if I turn to you, Barbara, and I say, honey, I just, I, I can't do it this week. I'm just not up for putting the kids in dresses and making their hairs all pretty and then going across that parking lot and all that confusion. And you know how little Joey is when we get in the crowds. I'm too tired. You go to church. I'll stay home with the kids. Mm -hmm. And that becomes a pattern that develops week after week year after year. And so now you have either half the family not participating or participating in a different experience on a different day from a different perspective. And yet the mission is to grow the family together. And yet the place that's supposed to be doing it is actually, I don't want to say encouraging it, but almost forcing them to grow apart. Right. And those tools we put in, I love how you termed that pulling down those barriers of, uh, you know, still it's up to that family to make the commitment. Still it's up to the family to say, no, we're going to do this, but how can we put some systems in place so that we make it as easy as possible? Does that, would that uh, person who might happen to be a single parent, would it be helpful for them if they had those wagons as you speak of, or even valet parking? Tell me there's not six members of your youth group who would love to be valet parkers <laughs> on a Sunday morning where people can just drive up to the door and um, get out and, and head where they need to go and not have to manage diaper bags and, and everything along across that parking lot, right? So how can we um, build in some, many times they're very simple. It just takes, as you mentioned, it takes those eyes. It takes noticing the barriers um, and what it would be like. Uh, to be in somebody else's shoes and how can we make that a, a better experience you know and uh, again whether that's all through universal design or whether that's through that family that you know that two of their children require a lot of support in order to get out the door in the morning do you have four people who are willing to be part of a 
care plan or a personalized plan uh, that one week of the month they start their Sunday morning over at that person's house to help with transportation or, or things or whatever that may be. Um, you know, how can we through both those universal supports and then coming alongside that family or that individual um, allow that to be uh, barrier free, not just with the physical pieces, but sometimes the barrier, you name them, might be anxiety, might be the amount of effort it would just take to even get there. Yes, we have a barrier free building, right? But what are those uh, remaining barriers? So I love how you put that. Very Thank good. you. Yeah. And I, I think, so let's go back to, okay, some of the people listening might be organizing a conference. How important to check out that facility to find out, okay, are there options for people who are uh, wearing hearing aids? Are there options for people um, with, with some mobility challenges? Are there options for people, like you said, with restrooms and, and places like that? So sometimes I think it helps us choose facilities and where we're going to meet if we're a little bit aware. And I also think um, if there's a registration process for something, we're, we're hosting a, a conference in a couple of weeks. And one of the key things we always ask um, in order to best participate, are there some accommodations that would be helpful to you? So we know in advance um, from the participants, from the adults that are coming, um, what things would be helpful for them. And we will do everything we can from diet to, um, you know, how we're going to set up rooms, those kinds of things to best facilitate all of the people who are attending. So I, I really think um, that's, that's helpful. And if you think 20 to 25 percent, uh, you know, that's a large set of, of people. I Spare me or permit me one more example. I, I actually took. Oh, please. I'm going to read a comment yeah. over here. Oh, OK. I, I, this is, a, this is a, a, what I think so often communities, whether that's a school or a, a church or whatever it may be. Uh, but let me go again back to congregations because our focus is on that faith growth and barriers there. But I, uh, I often think congregations are masters of building cans of things. They have cans for children's ministry, for women's ministry, for seniors, for evangelism, for worship. And they hear this idea of, oh man, now we have to think of people who may have some disabilities. And right away they think, oh, we need to build another can. And I right away put up my hand and say, stop, don't think that way. First of all, draw a line on every one of your cans. A 20 to 25% of that can already statistically, will have some kind of a disability, much less those varied abilities we talked about that can fill up a, a can very quickly. I said, I think you're way better of imagining um, this initiative as shredded cheese. Shredded cheese that gets uh, sprinkled through each one of those cans. Maybe it's a person with some expertise that can help with that. Maybe as you're planning a conference, you specifically look for somebody who is able to come alongside of you thinking for uh, how can we make this most successful. Maybe in a, in a congregation, it's not setting up a special can. Maybe what it sets up is supports for natural owners of those cans. So maybe the shredded cheese comes alongside the children's pastor, comes alongside the worship pastor, comes alongside whoever that may be, so that they get some expertise uh, so as a worship pastor, I own 100% of the people in my can, but I'm going to get some help or some support or some ideas from the shredded cheese department. Does that make sense? Uh, it's, for, for sometimes me? as the parent of a kid with disability, I'm often like, can you manage her? Can you handle her? I don't mean to impose upon you the language that we use. And one day somebody said, no, we need her here. I was like, looking at him like, you have not met my child. <laughs> and they said they're commenting on the puzzle piece, right? Yes. We need that she here. teaches our other kids patience and empathy and adaptability and all of those things. And I thought, now okay, you're seeing the shredded cheese and how you can implement and and use her gifts within that community and also the gifts of the children to help and run alongside her. And here's the thing, if there's 25% of a population or a community or a group sitting at home and you lower the barrier for 5%, that 5% may have the answer for the next five and the next five and the next five. 
So yes, maybe we have fidget pencils or spinners or whatever, and the pew packets because you want to bring your child alongside and they tend to have ADD or something like that. And this allows them to have a coloring, a distraction. They may be better able to help you cope with children with other needs in service. So don't think of how do I get to all of them all at once? Think of what can I do today? Or what can I go to my church, to my fellowship group, to my place of worship, my place of gathering, the community center that I participate in, and start, as I call them, using my barber eyes, looking around saying, if I was old and I needed, I'm old, if I needed a walker or special assistance, and I was coming in after worship service, could I attend based on the guy pointing the flashlight at the carpet, trying to show me where my seat is? No, I wouldn't. No. I wouldn't feel safe. I wouldn't feel, I, I wouldn't want, so what do I do? I get there and I realize worship has started. I sit in my car and I go home. Right. Barrier, barrier to worship. Absolutely. Yeah, oh, I, um, I get so excited when you talk about this because that's so true. You don't need to do everything at once. Uh, but, but to just begin somewhere, pick something, pick one thing or three things to just put in place, yeah. you know? As I'm um, sitting there and it's like, how do I get up there to get communion? Because I'm in a leg brace. So I don't participate. So now again, that feeling of exclusion or non-inclusion and that loss of that moment, that feeling, that symbolism, because often the sermon leading up to it has motivated me to stand up and make that commitment and I can't. And so now I haven't made the commitment and I'm struggling with, did I make the commitment? My Like all of that confusion when right. it's just, hey, if you can't come to the front, let us know. We'll bring it to you. Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. Options. Large print or video screens that have the, um, the program where somebody could read it on a large screen versus having to look at their little pocket version they got handed on the way in. Um, in but the dark. <laughs> that's another big tool, universal design wise, we often suggest, and that is, can you make some things available ahead of time? Technology is so advanced. I know one woman, they sent her the PowerPoints uh, and which scripture is going to be read each Sunday because she has a brailler at home, a braille printer. And so she just prints off what she needs on her brailler. And now she can join in to the singing, to the, to the, responsive reading, whatever that might be. And they tell her which book of the Bible because a Braille Bible has many sections to it. And for her to take the entire thing would be a barrier. So she just has that information ahead of time. But many people, if they can put on their device uh, the words or whatever, they can make it so that it's a readable thing to them. And um, it's, you know, it's a matter of getting some things available Saturday night or Sunday morning or whatever that might be. Um, that's a that's an easy one. Go to the church website, yeah. and again, using video format again because of right. visual disability or inabilities, is to say if you go on Saturday, we'll just make a simple announcement of what passages or what yeah. references we'll be making, and then I can go home and I can look them up on my phone, my iPad, my reader, whatever, and either read them the night before so I'm already caught up or have them available for me yeah. so that I can look at it in large print without having to, again, it's just saying, look, we realize that we go quickly and that things happen. And if I announce it, then you've got to find it and then you've got to expand it and then you've got to catch up here, just giving you a heads up. We'll be reading. And again, not to make it just about the person that needs the reader, but if I did the homework before the service, how much more engaged would I be during the service? Isn't that a delightful thought that we engage our hearts in worship before we ever get to that place yeah, that we've been just, prepared? It, once you engage, once you begin to learn into it and think, wait a minute, you know, do we have an area that, again, people have to walk across carpet, people with certain muscle motor or ambulatory things, it's difficult to navigate on carpet. What would it take to make one of those runners that they could feel more comfortable, more secure walking on? 
What would it take to provide better lighting in certain parts of the sanctuary so those people that felt more comfortable in a, in a lit space would have a place to sit? What would it take to designate an entrance into the sanctuary that was for those that need extra time to get through the doorway or need to pick up a braille Bible or a pew packet or want to prefer to sit on the outside because they don't want to be squished in the middle and in contact with strangers because again, certain kids on the spectrum need need space. <laughs> it, well, it's and, funny, and I go what, into my kids' classroom. You know, uh, you mentioned something important, but getting some shredded cheese expertise, somebody who knows a little bit about design, just the things you're mentioning, to come alongside the deacons or the people who are in charge of the facilities. Um, again, that's using some expertise to give some guidance to those in charge of those of those places of thinking. And I think that's a really important um, tool. You know, we all get to play. Uh, everybody who has a role in church needs to be thinking for this. If you're the organist, if you are the choir director, if you are the facilities person, if you purchase products for the bathroom, you need to be aware of some things related to universal design. But I do, uh, we have a lot more information. I just want to make sure I say this on the All Belong website. If you go to allbelong.org uh, and look for supports for churches, there's a document that says, what role do you play in church? Who are you? Are you a greeter? Are you an organist? If that's you, here are some things you might want to think about. And very often we give specific tools. So if you're looking for fragrant, uh, fragrance-free products for your bathroom, we even have a link on there to a place that we sort of found less expensive ones listed. But so lots of tools on there for congregations, but other settings as well. You can adapt that to a variety of um, places. But and again, I when you go to the website, understand that when you read that list of resources and how as a greeter, how as a provider, you can begin to break down. Think about it across all things. We've got holidays coming up. And we always want to invite our family and our cousins and our uncles and our aunts and their mothers and their brothers. And there's, do we know anybody in that population that might need special assistance? And is my house the ideal place at the top of a steep driveway with 20 steps? Or do I have to say, by the way, Joe, we know you're coming. We're saving the space out in front of the house or we've cleared out the garage. So just pull straight into the garage so you can have one like start thinking about who can I include that may be sitting at home wanting to participate in whatever's going on, but they've already become so aware of the barrier because their life has been filled with them that they don't want to try one more time. Right. They've, I mean, they've given up and I, it's sad to say, but as many people, it's just so exhausting. Well, and holidays bring so many things to mind. I'm so glad you brought that up because I think, uh, even as uh, there may be a member of a family who needs some additional information. I've often said, if you're hosting, uh, or if you are the parent of a child or an individual you know is part of your family who might need something additional, um, you know, can you send out a schedule in advance of what you're going to be doing there? Can you designate a room in your house that's a quiet space? Uh, maybe make it uh, Justin's quiet space for the day, whoever that may be. But are there some things that you can do to make your home barrier free uh, for that holiday event? Would it be helpful to send out a quick email to say, hey, uh, Justin's parents just want you to know, here are some great topics you could talk to Justin about. Or we've designated Justin as our photo taker for the day. Um, you know, hopefully you can smile great when he's going to, you know, what can you do? Do you uh, rearrange the furniture and then allow Justin in? before everybody's there to be able to sort of see what grandma's house looks like now that the table's moved and it looks different. Can he come earlier or the day before to help put napkins out so that he's been in that space as it's been rearranged? You know, it's sometimes it's just thinking of those little things that can make a day go much better. And those parents that are so nervous that they're, oh no, here's Christmas again. Um, but as a team, we're gonna make Christmas work for everybody who's in here. Uh, and to share some information. So using the Justin I, I example, think, there are children with ADD and HDHD and autism that often the level of stimulant triggers a behavior. And so as a parent, it's like, okay, 
if I take my kid into this environment, we can only stay for 30 minutes because that's about his breaking point. Like you start to strategize exits and things like that. What if I said, hey, I understand Justin's needs. What I've done is we've cleared out the back bedroom. Whenever you feel he needs some, some downtime, I just want you to know it's there. There's some extra pillows, some extra blankets if he wants to lay down. We've hooked up the TV in there if he wants to watch it. And don't ask permission. Just when you feel the need, it's there. Yes. And it doesn't have to be calling out Justin's behavior. It's just I know that with my kid, that because she has to process so much information and everything takes like hyper energy, that there are points in the day that I'm like, okay, we're limited. We're done. We're out. And now I have to bring the whole family out of the activity versus if I could just take her and we often do it. We'll just go sit in the car and listen to music for 30 minutes. And if that's what you have to announce ahead of time, say, look, there may be a moment where you see me sitting in the car with Justin. Nothing's going on. I just needed to bring him down. Exactly. So please, you know, just know what's happening. Again, it's awareness. And this is about understanding that as people of faith, as coaches, as influencers, as leaders, we're neglecting a population. And I don't think we intend to, but we get so busy running forward fast that we don't stop and say, I could make one little change, gluten-free communion station in the back or all gluten-free. Um, how that would reduce the anxiety and the stress and the fatigue that instead of maybe participating once a month in service, they would actually begin to participate bi-monthly or weekly. And what would that impact look like as they left church, now feeling full and complete and centered in their faith, back into their families, back into their communities, back into other areas? It, it's, it's, it's such a critical lesson. And I so appreciated when you like started telling me how easy it was because I was the guy that thought it had to be really extreme. Like we got to put in another bathroom, an elevator, carve up the parking lot, get rid of all the carpet, make all the signs braille, have speaking coughing machines. You know, I had like gone to the extreme. Yeah. Right. And uh, you know, it doesn't, I think you start and start with the people who are already there. Who's already part of your community. Uh, you know, universal design, great. Do what you can there because that just benefits everybody. But as you think of those more personalized plans, who has God already placed in your community? Who's who's missing? Who used to be there and isn't there now? And with a few tools or resources, um, uh, a few thoughtful care plans, uh, whatever that might be, uh, can that individual be part again? Again, it benefits the whole community. I'm in so God's given everyone gifts, we're, we're better off with that person within our community than not there. So uh, I, I agree. I, and at that point of who was here, that's no longer, why did they stop coming? Because first, no matter what the, the barrier was, the mission is to bring them back. That's right. And if there was a barrier that was inadvertently created, then why not knock it down? And I love the idea of having on the bulletin or on a special bulletin each week, how could, what could we do to help you better participate or to enjoy this service more? Yep. I don't get a feedback card each week. <laughs> right. And trust me, no, my PK, Pastor Kevin's pretty good. But when was the last time they asked me that question? Right. Yeah. Um. Willing to ask, willing to make some changes, um, willing to say, you know what, the 100%, one body together in Christ is worth it. Um, even if we need to, as that one passage says, look not to your own interests, but to the interests of the others. Uh, do we need to lay some things down in order to allow that one body to come together? So, And if you're not sure how to have the conversation, with your with your church group or with your minister or with your small group or even in your schools and communities, Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, wherever people gather, I guess is truthfully it. Send them this video just like, hey, I saw this. Did you ever hear these things? 
send them the information that's available on the website. It's like I was exploring and I found this resource guide and I thought it might be helpful. I get it. We sometimes elevate our church staff to this high position and we feel like we have to follow because no, it's a, it's a group working together for a common cause. And if you bring a new knowledge, if you bring a new awareness, if you bring a new perspective into that church, then that was the gift that you were asked in divine manner to bring was this video, this awareness, this begin of transformation. Maybe you've been looking for a spot of how do I begin to participate? And you just step forward and say, I'm not an expert, but I'm willing to start making suggestions and let's work together. There's somebody that's gonna bet. There's got that one starfish kind of thing. There's got to be one person that's going to benefit mm -hmm. oh, from absolutely. you becoming more aware. Absolutely. No, I I think that's so true. Yeah, and we have a couple of shorter videos too on our website that it intended to catch the the eye of the leadership because you need your leadership on board. You need to continue to ask those questions. Yeah, absolutely. So website once again. Oh, uh, allbelong.org, um, and that's. Um, We'll look for the church services tab and we have some information and there. So, so maybe and if they like, want to find you. What if we went and just drew a circle in our school cluster and got all of the churches involved in that school cluster because we're not in competition and had a discussion like this? What would that look like? A mastermind, a, a meeting, a, a Barbara printing out the information and just having a brain dump and brainstorm session that you could yes. facilitate, that you could lead. Again, don't think big, think big impact. It doesn't take a lot to change the world. And as Barbara said, just having a place where people can feel safe and welcomed is what this is about. Yes, absolutely. Oh, this has been a good discussion. Very I, I, I tell you, you are my superhero now. I'm nominating you for every one of those top 10 CNN kind of awards. You. It's awareness and I love, I mean, I was blind until I saw and you gave me that vision to just start looking around and that's all it really is. Just look around people. So I thank you for what you do. I thank you for what your organization does because it does it not only in churches, but across all spectrums, um, uh, in, including kids like my daughter um, and finding ways to make sure that she has the fullest and richest expression of her life. As you think about Thanksgiving, because so, that's coming up, whether this is in your home or in other places. If you are in charge of a Thanksgiving service, consider that not everybody likes to hold a microphone and talk. A great universal design piece would say, you could say what you're thankful for into the microphone, or you could text your thing that you're thankful for to this phone number and we'll read it out loud for you, right? So somebody might be willing to text uh, an idea as opposed to have the courage to grab that microphone. That's a simple thing. And then the person with that phone can just, you know, read the text that they've received. Uh, another thing that um, I was going to say is uh, sometimes you might have people that are unable to speak. Just have a few pictures of things that people might be thankful for. So if they would prefer to show somebody what they're thankful for, well, then that's another way uh, that they can communicate um, thankfulness. So again, we all have different ways that we express our thankfulness. Sometimes we only hear from the people who are willing to stand up and speak that. Um, but are there other ways, either through pictures or um, even, even signing, saying thank you to God? Could we all do that? There are multiple ways to be able to do that. So Again, just wanted to, to uh, say thankfulness to you. I am thankful for you today, this opportunity, uh, even equipping people's eyes. And if we at All Belong can be helpful to you um, in any way as communities that are listening today, let us know. Uh, that's We are not the front line. We stand to equip the front line. You are the people who change the stories. You are the people who make room for the that family, for the individuals that want to be part of that uh, setting. Um, and, and I just, um, just, I think of that one family that's been divided over their faith or is never really engaged in faith because the primary caregiver stays home to manage, to manage the child can now begin to experience that, that 
that fellowship, that communion, that support that our churches offer and how that can not only transform their life, but their kids' life and generational. So I thank you for what you guys do. You are, like I said, you're one of my favorite people. Well, I'll keep hanging around with you because you make me feel so good. <laughs> thank you, Eric. <laughs> All right. I'll talk to you later. Thank you again. Have a good day. Thank you. Bye-bye. You guys, thank you again for joining me for today's Success Life Live. That was Barbara Newman. Um, we have posted her website here in the comments, and I'll make sure it gets put in the show notes as well. But I think the important conversation really was, who are you going to be around or where are you going to be at? And is it inclusive for all? Does it take a moment and say, whoops, maybe we need to turn up the light. Maybe we need to offer this alternative. Maybe we need to have this or that. Or maybe we simply need to take a moment and ask, what would make participation in this service better for you? And you might be surprised. How often do churches ask for feedback? Remember, our church, our community, whatever that faith looks like, whatever that fellowship, whatever that gathering looks like, is designed to lift up all people, to include all people. And so please take a moment and ask, are we getting, like this isn't a special, I, I really enjoyed Barbara's analogy of the, the can versus the shredded cheese. This doesn't take a whole new department, a whole new division, a whole new budget. It just takes a whole new awareness of what we're doing and not doing.